I had a lovely chat with Madeline last week and um, on our experience of going through the light and then she suggested that we needed to get Clint on the show because he holds so much knowledge around um, the creationist stories and um, so I'm just going to hand it straight over to you Clint. Madeline, Love it. I, I, that's just beautiful yeah okay. and, and yeah. I think my viewers would be really um, annoyed if we didn't ask you what your connection was with the little people. You. Oh, me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I think it was, I think it was around the time things started to get a little bit slower. Like I, I was getting humbugged every night. I think I'd spoken to Ben, and it might have been a couple of months after that, and I was in the toilet. And I know for those people that connect with spirit, they will understand this. But there was this. Um, presence around me and I suddenly tuned into it and I realized it had been with me quite a while and and I was sort of like okay and I was on the toilet, got to the toilet and then I looked around and it was almost like I saw it in the corner of my eye but then when I looked like you know it wasn't there but then I guess <laughs> my third eye to to zone in and I was expecting to see a taller figure you know when you sort of um, I guess scan rooms. That's how I do it anyway. And you sort of pick up energy. It was sort of like <laughs> there was nothing there. And then there was just this tiny little dude, and he was just standing there, like I don't know. He was really funny. He was like, "What do you want me to do?" Like he was sort of wanted wanted to help me. Um, and it, he was frustrated that I hadn't given him like a little job. And um, yeah, this. Was, this is around the time it was like April, I think maybe April, and um, and I I can't I think I said I I was like oh gosh um well you can um protect the front door he can put a protection I can't know I gave him some kind of job and he was very happy then and toddled off and then I spoke with Clint because I was like there's this small thing in my room I've got in my house I don't know what he is and then yeah Clint was able to explain to me a little bit more about them um which I'll hand over to Clint and he can share a little bit more but then I was feeding him all these different things <laughs> I didn't have kangaroo they like kangaroo and I was giving him like dried um yeah I don't think he was into that but then I gave him another job which is quite funny I think some people probably laugh at this but I was like can you possibly go and see Scott Morrison and visit him in his sleep and activate his heart so that he's able to make the make decisions from his heart? Anyway, he hasn't. My little guy hasn't returned back since, and that was April. <laughs> and I kid you not, like I have not noticed him around. We've moved house now. Um, when I did a channeling earlier this year, the spirit that came through said that he had met up with some friends in the desert. I don't know. That was that was a message that came through, but he hasn't come back yet. <laughs> but Clint might be able to explain a little bit more about them because they're, I don't know, I love them. They're so cute. So Malango is the spirit that Maddie is referring to is a little, they're like little people. Um, there are male and female versions of them. And the male versions, they're, or both of them, they're very protective, but the female ones are super protective and very powerful, very powerful, actually. But the male ones are the most common ones that you see, and um, they, uh, they're they cheeky little spirits. They like to mess, mess around with you sometimes, you know, and um, they, they're, they're little pranksters, you know. They like to... Sometimes I'm laying in bed, and when my one comes and visits, um, they'll jump on top of me while I'm asleep and put the blanket over my head and they like to really stir you up. Um, <clears throat> but they're good. They're really good spirits and they're protective and they keep really bad things away from you, all the bad spirits. Um, they've been around forever. So they were created, you know, when I was talking about the Marga creating things, they were created by the Marga as, as like children spirits and they're small because they're mostly um meant to be spirits for for kids because you know when you're a kid 
you you probably all know the same sort of story. You when when you were young is when you picked up on your your spiritual connection, you know, from a young, really young age, and you started seeing things, and and then you also you weren't just seeing good things. You you might have been seeing bad things. So their job is to protect us kids during that time when they are awakening to their to their um, abilities. Um, and the, and the first thing a lot of the time the kids see is the malangu, and the malangu will look after them and protect them. But they'll also play with them, and so parents think that the kids have imaginary friends, but it's the it's the little people, it's the malangu that they're playing with. So they're attracted, mostly attracted to children, but they protect everybody, and. <clears throat> They'll always come to people who are in need. Um, so Maddie was going through a tough time, and and um, yeah, they saw that you were in need, or this little fellow saw that you were in need, and that's when he came to you. And I like how you said that you you saw it on the corner of your eye. So the corner of your eyes, your peripheral vision, is how you normally see things. Um, but when you look at them straight, like straight forward, you don't see them. Um, so, what? Why the reason that is? And this is this is just a um, anatomy thing. Is your peripheral vision is built to see into the dark, in you know, help you see at night and all that sort of stuff. Whereas your direct vision um, helps you see in, in the light. You know, see. Um, so it focuses the light, but you see in the dark here. So what that means is these spirits, they live and are more active in the dark. But they can they come out during the day too, but you can't see them with your normal vision. So a lot of the times to, uh, to let you know that they're there, they'll come into your peripheral vision and you'll see them off to the side. But when you look at them, that's why a lot of people, um, they see something and they like, ah. Oh, Maybe it was just my imagination playing with, playing with me, you know. They're not, it's not your imagination. You actually saw what you saw. But when you look there, you're like, oh, nothing's there because you can't see it with that front vision unless you use your, your third eye, your, um, your spiritual eye, we say. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, that's when, when you act about it, it's like you got to, it's like you put a visor on over your face and you're like, oh, now I can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but most people can't do that, see? So they see these things and they see them because those little people or whatever it happened to be, in this case, it's the Malago. Um, the Malago are there to, to tell you that I'm here. I know that you need help. What do you want me to do? And that's why I was asking you, you know, what, what, what do you need me to do for you? Yeah. Yeah. So you got to give them, give them a job. Yeah. I gave them but a the job. girl ones, yeah, the girl, the girl ones, man, they are powerful, super powerful. Yeah. Female ones. Nothing can, I've, I've been, um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, um, we went up to Darwin, me and my brother-in-laws and that, and uh, we went up partying. We didn't do the right thing. We didn't go and see the traditional owners and ask for a welcome. And, and But we went up just thinking, oh, yeah, we'll do the Aussie thing. We'll go party and carry on, have a good time. But eventually we got caught out. And there was this woman who is a living woman um, who was... Um, Spiritual, uh, we say modern is a healer, but they also can use their abilities for no good. People would call her a witch, you know, in in, in the English language. But they're not always bad. But this woman was pretty bad, actually. So she tried to sing us. She tried to make us fall in love with her. Um, but more specifically, my brother-in-law, and tried to take us and and came and bothered us every day while we were there and um, terrorizing us, going through the house in spirit form and opening and closing cupboards and fridges and banging around and everything. And we couldn't sleep, weren't able to sleep for days. Um, and that should only come at night. So we had to leave. 
So we left Darwin. We came straight back, straight back to the Pilbara. We didn't no mucking around. We got back. I went and saw, saw my pop, and he said, "I'll, I'll give you my girl." Talking about the little girl spirit, she'll protect you. Nothing will bother you. <clears throat> so I'm at home, and um, yeah, n- nothing would come and bother me. No, the spirit followed us all the way from Darwin, by the way, all the way back to here, three thousand kilometres nearly, and was terrorising the other guys who didn't have this little girl protecting them. But I had nothing bothering me. Good sleep. The only time I didn't sleep was when I saw the little girl. But I'd, I would, I'd be laying down and I'd see her down near my feet. And and there was one time I was just, I fell asleep in the lounge. I must have been watching TV or something and I fell asleep. And then I, it was dark. I was, you know, about to get up, go, go in the room and have a rest. But as I woke up, I could see this figure of a small girl standing by my feet, staring at me, watching me. She gave me a little fright. And I'm, I woke up and I'm like, sometimes you, you're groggy, you don't know what you're seeing, you know, when you wake up from sleep. I don't know, I thought I was just dreaming or whatever. And then I look, I'm like, oh, no, she's actually there standing right next to my feet. And I get up to try and talk to her, but she, she runs away. See her run, she runs down the hallway. And where the kitchen is, the hallway and the kitchen connected, she shuts the door behind her. So I walk into the kitchen, kitchen area. And in the kitchen, where the kitchen area is, there's a separate lounge room, little area where I, that's where I go when my mother-in-law visits, by the way. So that's why I got a separate lounge, because I can't talk to my mother-in-law. Anyway, <clears throat> went in there, my brother-in-law, who was the one that the main one out of all of us was being terrorized, because um, he came and stayed with us, stayed with me, because I told him, come stay with me and let this thing won't bother you, you know. Um, anyway, so I walk in there and I look at him and he's, and he's watching a movie. And he looks up at me, and, I, and I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and we're not talking to each other, sort of like reading each other's body language. And he said, and then he said to me, what happened? And I said, oh, nothing. And then he looked at me and said, no, what happened? And I'm like, ah, oh, you didn't see someone run past here, did you? And he said, well, I saw a little girl run past. <laughs> and I'm thinking, ah, oh, yeah. That's the little girl my pop left here to, to look after us. And he said, ah, oh, because he thought it was that woman trying to come. She just saw a person with long hair run past, you know? Yeah. And yeah, but I said, no, nah, it's all right. It's all good. But we both saw it, and it was a funny thing. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. That, that's just made me think because there's so many spirits here in this town. There, When I was working at the Shire, there was a little girl. Everyone knew there was a little girl in the Shire, and I had felt her. <laughs> next to me I don't know if she put her hand on me or I just felt her warmth one time she told me she told me she was here because she loved the children she wanted to look after the children and oh, yeah. there was a woman yeah so I'm thinking maybe it's actually because I was thinking it was a like a girl that had died or a little girl that had died and had just decided to go to this library but there was a woman that was working there and she would yell at the kids all the time like when they were doing story time and they wouldn't be quite you'd yell at them and one time she was in the library this is a story everyone that works at the shy um when she was when when she was there one time she came back um she was in the library she got shoved and then she fell and then a book flew off the wall or the, i don't know one one thing happened before the other but she got shoved and a book fell off onto the floor and the book was all about like murder and death and like <laughs> Like a like a book to kind of scare her, and she, yeah, not long after that, I'm pretty sure she quit. But it was just so funny, and now I'm like, oh, it must be, yeah. Yeah, I reckon one of them. Around. Little girl. Yeah. So they're like um, the from a their origin, the Malangu is well, they all they are they're, they're like the children of the Malangu, basically because they were created by them, you know. Um, but they were created as little protectors to protect people um, because they were, you know, they were bad spirits. And when the Marga left us, they knew we needed protecting from mm. these bad spirits and they left these little people with us to, to look after us. Mm. Yeah. 
but we call him Malango, as you know, but for the listeners. Awesome. Awesome. Um, can I share a story with you, Clint? Um, yeah. I, I put this on Uluru the other day, uh, Uluru Speaks. I don't know if you can see, like, the man in that rock. Um, I can cut. Yeah, I can cut. It's kind of see. Yeah, kind of see his eyes there and his arm, and he's he's like writing on a scroll, or like or, or on a, on a scroll, and he's that. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, yep. His shoulder there. <laughs> um, so quite a, like a, just a beautiful rock. If I bring it back a bit, you might be able to see. Um, yeah, but very yeah. very defined with his eyes, his nose, all of his features. I was. Um, on a property where I was walking up this hill and um, I was going through a really hard time at the time. I was going through divorce and bankruptcy and homelessness and I'd just been diagnosed with breast can aggressive breast cancer and so it was all at the same time. So it's, you know, I've got a really big Titanic ship. <laughs> um, I walked up this hill and it's a very steep, very, very steep hill and I was walking up the gully with all my animals. They all follow me. I had, pet I had kangaroos that I was looking after and they were kangaroos and the dogs and the cats would all follow me up this gorge and I would just I it was so steep I'd have to sit in the middle of this um gorge and um just taking the view and all the animals just lay around me and I just all of a sudden felt like someone was watching me and um I started sort of hearing whispers and I looked down the ground and there was you know this beautiful rock with this person in it right I'd sat right next to it. It was like, woof, <laughs> like straight out. And um, and he he sort of just told me he was like a scribe. And uh, I my life turned around. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that was the only reason my life turned around, but um, I feel like sometimes we get this guidance or these spirits that come yeah. to us. And, uh, you know, my life is thriving and, you know, miracle after miracle sort of happened. And, um, you know, my life is is you know, I, I'm just so have such a blessed life now, but, um, you know, I had, I was stripped of just everything was taken from me and, um, I had to put, I had, it was my surrender moment, my God moment, you know, where I surrendered completely to God. But I just love yeah. that, 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 that spirit came through the rock. Cause I'm so connected to rocks. You know, I love, I love rocks. Um, is that something that you, uh, that you can talk about more about those rocks, the spirits in the rocks. I saw a spirit in the rock last night. Um, I was out mud crabbing, but I see the same one all the time when I'm on my own. Um, there's um, a place called Hearson's Cove. The place there behind me in my picture. I was out there. So when the tide goes out, I, I go mud crabbing and. Um, this area so actually if, if you look which side uh i'm not good with my left hand that that rock yeah that rock there so beautiful. that rock there yeah so that light colored rock behind me is a marga bee that stayed behind from um the dream time and stayed behind to look after people specifically at this place but also stayed behind more specifically to look after and take care of women and children. Yeah. So his job was to protect people as like a sentinel. Uh, what do you call it? Yeah. 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 Um, so when you go to this beach, this cove, it's, you feel really at ease. You know, you feel really, um, like you're protected, well, you are, you know, from a spiritual perspective. But anybody who goes there, everybody has a good time. They, they get this really good vibe, good energy from that place, you know, and, and you feel welcome. That's the word I was thinking of. Um, so I, I knew that this was a spirit, and there's a carving rock art of him up on, up on the hills there um, behind me. Anyways, first time when I went out there at night, I went there mud crabbing and it was dark and, and I was with people, but I could feel this presence was there, but it wasn't like a bad presence. You can always tell when they're bad. But anyways, I thought, oh, yeah. Felt it on the day. I didn't tell anybody about it. And some other time, um, I try not to spook people, you know, so 
while we're out. Don't want don't want people getting scared. But not another time I go out, but I go out on my own, <clears throat> and then I'm out there. I go out in the afternoon, and then it gets dark, and I'm getting like um um really into the mud crabbing, you know, and catching heaps of muddies. And then it's getting really dark, and I'm like, oh, hey, I'm out here on my own. And I'm thinking, should I even be out here on my own at this time of the night, you know? What if a, what if a bad spirit comes, comes along and I'll be buggered, you know? They might chase me or something or other. So I decided I'll, I'll, I'll go. So I took my mud crabs, started walking back. No one else was there. I was on my own. And then I just had this feeling to look at this hill, rocks, you know. And as soon as I turned to my left to look at it, I just saw this humongous face staring straight back at me in the stone, you know, big, gigantic head. Um, and it, I was taken aback a little bit, by it, but once I looked properly at it, and I, I was like, this is the spirit now, this the spirit from this area watching me. But I had this feeling of ease, like, it was basically saying to me, don't, don't get scared, don't be worried. I'm just keeping an eye on you, making sure you're okay. Because I was on my own, you know. And then after that, I'll go back all the time, mud crabbing on my own at night, because I know that spirit's always watching over me, looking at me. But but um, I never told people that I didn't show them that face, you know. And then one time I went out and um, we were having a barbecue out there on the beach. And I brought my cousin out with me. And he hardly ever goes to there. A lot, a lot of my people don't like going there. They, they're scared because there used to be a massacre out there. So they, they're worried about all the spirits who died out there. You know, so they don't like going there. Um, but I said, no, you'll be right. This place is really safe, you know. Um, and we were just having a barbecue, having some drinks. And the next minute he taps me on the shoulder. We were sitting next to each other. And we call each other Ijara. Ijara meaning... Um, uh, brothers in, in the law where we went through initiation together. Hey, 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 what happened? There's a man over there. Where? What are you talking about? Can't you see big face looking straight at us? And he pointed at that same rock that I saw before, you know. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I see him all the time. What? He's like, yeah, he's just keeping an eye on us. But he's looking straight at us. Like, yeah, he, it's your first time here, he's letting you know he's watching you, but in a good way, you know. <laughs> so, because he, you know, he, he didn't feel comfortable being there in the first place, and that that man revealed himself to my cousin, but he, he, I think he just needed me to, to um, confirm what he had saw and also told him what it was about, you know. And, and I said, no, if you, this is your first time here, just keeping an eye on you, making sure you're right because he know you was frightened to come out here in the first place, you know? Mm. And so that happens a lot. You'll see faces will reveal themselves um, in stone all the time, in many places. And sometimes you catch them on photograph, you know, unintentionally, um, or some people take photos of them on purpose, you know, but um, um, <clears throat> depending where you go, some faces are, like, very good, very friendly. Others are... are um, like uh, there's a there's a waterhole that I will not go to up near Madeline's side of the country where she's living, and uh, yeah, you know that thing you saw, mm. that thing you saw. Well, one of them lives in this waterhole, but my my cousin, his old man, they're at this place, and they took a photograph of it, just ordinary photo, just because it's, it's a beautiful waterhole. So he just took a picture of it. They got the photo developed, it's old, you know, old photos, got home, put it in a um, frame to put it up on the wall to show how beautiful this place was. And then they started staring at it and like, what the hell? They grabbed the photo, so it's orientated in a portrait. They flipped it up. No, sorry, it was an orientated landscape and flipped it up to a portrait mode. And the photo of the waterhole looked like the face of the devil. But it looked like one of the this that being that lives in that place. So it was a, we, a lot of Aboriginal people refer to them as hairy men, 
Um, mm-hmm. But we say bar, this thing is a bar, it's a, it's a mm-hmm. demon. So they have horns on their heads and ugly face and all that. But I've that's what you could that. see. Sorry. Yeah, you could see that in the photograph. But all it was was a reflection of the water with the trees and the, and the actual um, gorge. But when you flipped it sideways like that, it looked exactly like a face, and they lost it. They lost that photograph, but I, I remember seeing it. He showed me before. I was scary to look at. I was like, yeah, no, nah, I don't want to see that again. But they ended up losing it. Well, they didn't lose it. It disappeared one day, yeah. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you'll see that type of thing, but a lot, most of the time you'll see maybe the people from that area, like um, um, who are of that place, um, and like this being, you know, this, this creation being was there, letting, letting us know, watching over us. But I saw him last night again, clear as, like, yeah. yeah. It was like when I sat, I mean, of all the places I could sit, because this was like about a 450-metre rise from top to bottom that I was walking up, quite steep. And for all the places for me to sit, I'm sitting like right next to this rock and and, and to stop yeah. and stop view and then I hear it and feel it and then I look and it's like oh my gosh there's this man sitting in the rock and um Mm. it was so profound um I mean those sort of experiences are not unusual for me um being of the spirit world all my life but um I just I love if we're open to um receiving these beautiful gifts and these beautiful connections they're there for us and I think that's the thing is that the way I live and Madeline live and, and how you live, to me that is this is how we are meant to live as humans and yep. many of us have had that magic and that connection taken away from us and, um, you know, people have often, I've had to keep myself small and quiet. Um, as I said, like Mel and I have only just really come out about many things recently about our experiences because I felt like, I made people feel so uncomfortable talking about them because they, it was so foreign and they would think I was weird. And now I've really, uh, you know, I'm 53 and now I'm really embracing um, who I am. And Madeline's a lot like, younger. Thank God you can do it now um, mm-hmm. where I don't have to keep myself small anymore. And I don't care what people think anymore about um, I'm this weird person of the family that sees spirits and, um, astral travels and visits planets and has out of body experiences and has multiple timeline parallel life experiences or you know like my interdimensional experience is endless you know and I think that's what it really yeah. is to be human yeah that is that's that's the way we were intended to be that's how the Marga built us to be like that and luckily for who I am and where I'm from, that's normal to be like that, you know, that's, that's encouraged. That's in fact, it's favored, you know, when you're like that. Um, so you're not an outcast. You're, if anything, you're, you're like the special person in the family. Like, Oh yeah, that, if you want to know things, you've got to go talk to that person, you know, Yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll tell you what you need to know. So it's embraced. Whereas where your background, you know, on, you know, from a European point of view, and I think it's it's, it's got a lot to do with um, Romans bringing Christianity into Europe, persecuting that pagan paganism. You know that that old ways of living off the land and and spirituality. And you know they had the 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 people branded as witches and killed them and all this and that over. Period, that made people feel afraid to to express themselves to show that kind that part of themselves you know um, until modern day came along and, and and people were no longer following those kind of ways you know um, uh, I mean I'm saying the people the mainstream started not to be like you know persecuting anymore um, well I think not persecuting is um, literally, but energetically and yeah. um, <clears throat> we've still been persecuted. You know, like I feel like all of these yeah. things are to take us away from our true history and our true knowledge and our true birthright and our, our true passage of how we walk this life and, and so to keep us dumb and to keep us small and then we can be controlled and, and no one gets to ever really um, experience their full magnificence and, their, and, and, and the miracles and 
Um, and to be able to tap into the field and know that the space between all of us is filled with so much information. And, um, you know, we've been, so we might not get burnt at the stake, but we get burnt in other ways, like um, your reputation will get burnt or um, mm. your relationships with people will get burnt. So we're still, you know, I think more and more people are accepting this now. And I actually think right now in 2020, people are craving it. People are wanting to know because they're starting to, their DNA is starting to be triggered, the light's coming in and people are going, I'm, I'm getting these feelings. I've had a lot of people come to me um, saying, I've started, I've, I've had to go see a psychiatrist because I started seeing these tall white beings and that was freaking me out. And I, I was like, oh my God, no, don't do that. You know, this is, this is your yeah. awakening. Yeah. And yeah, like you, you're right. Um, it's gotten easier over the last, probably the last 50, 30, 50 years, you know, um, for everybody else, I suppose. Um, whereas my people, we never had that problem at all, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. it's just was part of life, it's normal. Um, but what I did find too, and, and like I was saying earlier, you know, I didn't tell people unless they really wanted to know because I was like, people would think that, well, the way I was thinking about it was that they didn't they didn't believe in my culture, they didn't believe in my beliefs, they didn't share that same thing, so they think you're talking crap, you know? Mm. And so, well, if you don't want to hear it, I'm not going to tell you. So I was silent about it for a long time as well, you know, in, in my life, especially when I was working in the mining industry. And, oh, yeah. The, you know, but um, after leaving that industry, I started to meet more people who are like-minded that want to know these sort of things and, and people who come on tours with me. Uh, most of the people who want to come on tours, they, they want to learn the history. Um, they want to learn more about um, the land and, and all that. But and, and they're just average sort of Joes. Um, shouldn't even say that word. But they're just the, the typical people, you know. <clears throat> And then you get then you get the odd person who's spiritual come on the tours, and they they want to really dive deeper into the culture and the spirituality, and and that's that makes it really worthwhile for me because that's that's what I'm all about. You know, that's, that's what my culture is all about is is to teach that side. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like all the rest of them aren't ready for that yet, but there are others out there who are willing and keen, you know, and <clears throat> that's the people. As of late, <laughs> more and more I'm starting to meet and connect with now. Um, but before it was like it wasn't. I don't know where all these people were, but now they're it's like they're <laughs> we coming out of the woodwork. Coming out of the woodwork. Um, yeah. There's another question. Just because there seems to be something um, that floats around the internet quite a lot in part of the ascension and diet. And uh, there's such a push for veganism and vegetarianism um, or, like, you know, all this way and that you're only going to ascend if you're, you're vegan. And, um, and like, I, I, I don't really ever want to have judgment around what anyone eats and the ascension process. But from your culture, what, what, what would you – how do you see that? We eat everything that is edible. Marga taught us that we get nutrients from kangaroo, from goanna, from emu, from many li living animals, you know, um, as long as we don't take more than we need. And we have to eat them too because some of these animals, from, so this, I'm talking spiritually now, we've got to eat them because some of these animals are reincarnated people. And the only way for them to be reincarnated back into people is to be eaten. And how that happens is a pregnant woman eats a particular animal, you know, so a kangaroo or whatever, the spirit of that animal jumps inside her womb. And then that baby is born. Um, so the baby is like, um, it's more or less a, sh not so much a shell, it's still a living organism, but it um, it gets this 
the spirit of this person who's been around a few times, but they come back as an animal, then jumps inside the baby. They they become then they become an old soul, um, but they're born with traits or knowledge from the past. Mm. So they're they're like amalgamated with this the soul from this other this animal you know, in this case. But that animal was was once a human in their past life. Um, <clears throat> and why they become a human is because they didn't do enough in their previous life to go and ascend and be with their marga, you know. So the marga sent them back down and said, oh, you've still got a few things you need to achieve before you can come back up here and be with us. So you, well, you're going to be reborn as an animal. You know, they'll, they'll tell you when you're up there. But when you, once you're, once you come back into this life, you don't remember none of that, you know. But then when you're born and you happen to be, oh, sorry, when that animal is killed and their spirit jumps into a, the womb of a woman who's pregnant and that baby is then born, they're born, first of all, with a birthmark. Birthmark reveals that they were, in fact, someone from another life previously. Um, and then you will gain the traits also of that animal that you were because that was your previous life before you became this human. <clears throat> and then the elders read that and they're like, this person, they, this little person we got in front of us is going to be a very wise person when they get older. They're going to have knowledge beyond anybody else because they are reborn. They come with knowledge from the past. You know, and they come with teachings that we need to learn. So, I'm saying to you, vegans, um, you gotta eat animals, even though you disagree with that. That goes against what you believe, but spiritually, this is what has to happen. Now, I, I, I definitely am against you know, like mass producing farming and all that sort of stuff. That's that's unnatural. But I'm talking about eating natural things like animals that are, that come from the country that that live normal natural lives that aren't being farmed, you know, like your kangaroos, like your emus, goannas, your fish, you know, barramundi, all that sort of stuff. That live in the wild. These are the ones we're talking about because that's the ones you get born reborn as when you come back. The ones that are connected to nature. Yeah, and, and I've sort of been, um, thank you, that's so beautiful, and I've sort of been of a similar philosophy. I had someone um, make a comment on one of my feeds yesterday about um, if we eat meat, we're really just housing a graveyard of animals. And I haven't responded yet to the comment, but I sort of, my I always try and be on the flip side of everything, and I think um, that, you can take animals, the spirit of animals, and have the animal spirit live through you. And if you are, yes. you bless your meat and you're grateful. And and uh, we we don't eat very much meat at all, but the meat we do <clears throat> eat is locally, it's local venison because they have no predators here. And a friend of ours, he only hunts for what we what he needs, and yeah. he yeah. gives a bit of venison. Um, and that's the only meat we we really eat, you know. So. Um, so I sort of feel like these these this deer is out of control, you know, and doing a lot of damage to the the fauna and the flora and the natural habitat. So it's because it has no natural predators. So I think um, you know, and we also have a, a self sustaining farm. We have a we have chickens and we have goats and um, and we try and we've got a veggie garden and, and and I feel like that's the way we've got to get back to being more sustainable and. Um, and not have all this judgment around what people do. And if you want to be vegan, be vegan. And if you want to eat meat, yes. um, I feel it's like you, the only thing I would say is try to be responsible in how you source that meat. And um, and I sort of feel like I take more energy on from those animals and, and integrate that in me and the knowledge from the animal. Um, so I don't feel like I have a graveyard. I feel like I have this beautiful resource and energy essence from the animal. Everything is a perspective of how you want to look at it. Yeah, but definitely what you're saying is that that energy you're getting from that animal is because um, the animal is innocent, it's good, you know. So you you yeah, and it's unfortunate how they get farmed and whatnot. But you're taking that energy into yourself and you're using it and you're using it in a positive way too, you know. Especially 
like, hey, your lifestyle, my lifestyle, all that. But <clears throat> it was taught to us. We, you know, this is not us just going out surviving. It's connected to our spirituality. And, and if you go and you, a vegan, you know, who has extreme views, are the ones who, you know, are very they're judgmental against people who eat meat. But I've, I've found a lot of vegans aren't either, you know. Like there's, there's a lot, lot of them who respect the choices that people make. Um, but if you went and you walked up to an elder, right, Aboriginal elder, especially the women, don't muck around with the women, <laughs> they'll tell you straight. They'll tell you straight out that you've got to eat these things because that's what was given to us on this earth to to nurture us and feed us and give us all the energy we need to be able to practice our law and culture, but also from a spiritual point of view that these animals are reborn people that have to be reincarnated because they didn't quite achieve the things that they needed to do in order to get into what some people refer to as heaven, but we say into Wanagurara to be with the Marga, the creation beings. And the Marga tell us in that life, in that afterlife, saying, no, you didn't do the, you didn't do everything you needed to do. You've got to go back because we're going to take, you're going to go back, but you're going to take some knowledge with you. But you also got to learn um, things along the way. And, and, and what it also does, it, it humbles you too, that experience. Because if you know you're reborn, you're like, oh, okay, right. So I've, I've been reborn. I didn't quite do the things I needed to do. I, I've got to do more. I've got to actually have to start making a big difference in this life, you know? Mm. So that's me. I was a kangaroo in my past life, you know? And um, my mother, my family hadn't killed that kangaroo and my mother hadn't eaten it. I wouldn't be here now talking about all this stuff. Mm. So. Yeah. I think it's not only more. animals that, um, like, I, I have this a weird thing that happens. I was breeding horses for many years and every pregnant mare, um, the spirit of the, the, the foal, the, it would visit me during the night and come and communicate. And um, often it would come in um, in a different form. So sometimes it would, it would, it would tell me who it was, this, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the spirit of, I'm in the, in the belly or in the womb of this particular horse uh, pony. And, um, and it would come through either as a dragon. Sometimes it'd come through as an alpaca or an elephant or a panther, or even some of these sort of animals that don't even exist on this planet. So I knew it was coming from another star system and they would come and communicate with me and I would draw them. They would show me their sex, their color, often tell me what they wanted their names to be and um, morph in and out of these other animals when they were communicating with me. And so often, well, actually every time they're born, they had these characteristics of these other animals in them as well, yeah. you know. And I just think this, this, um, this process of being born with these totems or connection to other animals isn't just reserved for us. The animals are having these support with other animals as well come through. And I think that I'm just, I feel so privileged that I get to see that and experience <clears throat> that with the animals. Well, I'll, I'll actually add to what I said too, is that you, ultimately you have to, that you're trying to be reborn as a human. But you might come back as many different animals before that happens, you know. And sometimes those animals don't get eaten by a pregnant woman. Most cases they don't, you know. So they've got to be reborn and reborn and reborn into other things until that eventually happens, you know. So these cows that are being mass-produced, chickens and, and the rest of it, you know, they could be housed in one of these animals, you know. Yeah. This, this spirit, um, these this what what might have what would have been people you know in in a previous life um and so from a spiritual perspective oh and by the way on top of that if they come in if they come into a farmed animal right there's, there's people uh, reborn as a farmed animal their chances of being reborn as a human is even higher you know um so if you were, like if you could choose to be born into something um, and you want to be reborn as a human and you know this in, in the afterlife, you'd probably choose a chicken or a cow, you know, 
something where you know they're only going to short life, they're going to be, um, not going to be the best life, but chances of being consumed by a human being is very high, you know. So they can be reborn and then come back and spread the message that they need to spread um, and also have a have another go at life um, to get it right in, in this next life, you know. But when, once you're born, the day you're born, as soon as you're, you know, this child, um, you – so you're born with all that knowledge, but you don't end up retaining it all. <clears throat> and then you, you get get a clean slate, um, but you've got to have experiences in your life that bring about all that knowledge, bring it back. And that's that's where you get more attuned to a certain thing, you know, like, um, you know, some people are really good at um, specific things better than others, you know, like, um, so they it, it, it could be like, um, um, they were, they might have been a scientist in their past life and they, or they might have been a builder or, or something or other. And, and so those skills shine through a bit more, more naturally. They're, that's what they're attuned to. Uh, me, I'm different. I'm, I'm good at, I'm good at anything I want to be good at. So I, um, it means I've been around a long, long time. I've been born and reborn again and again and again and again um, throughout the millennia. So I've picked up many things, many skills. And so I, today, anything I want to be able to do, and I, if, I, if I want to learn it, it, it'll, it comes to me really easy. Mm. So I was telling Madeline before that um, this is probably my last physical experience on this plan of existence, and that when I pass, I'll be gone, and that'll be it. I'm gone with the Marga. And this is my last trip, basically, yeah, um, because I've, I'm, I'm now at the stage where I've got to impart knowledge onto others and I've got to impart this ancient knowledge passed down through my current, my people now, you know, and, and um, yeah, because this knowledge is directly from the Marga themselves going back a long way. But I've got to, I can't just teach it the same way my people have taught it in the past um, because there are many other people out there with different, circumstances, different knowledge. So I teach it in a way that people can understand, you know. Um, I'm still teaching you the same knowledge, but I put it in a way that you can pick it up. Mm. Um, I'm a good interpreter, you might say. But I think I had to be, I had to go through many lifetimes to be able to become that person today. Yeah. Well, I'm so grateful for all of the stuff you're sharing with us here and, um, it's really amazing. Is there anything else, Melanie, you want to ask Clint? And I just will make a comment um, just on um, in terms of reincarnation and the information through, um, yeah, consuming animals. Um, I remember it was a while ago, like two years ago, and it popped up recently again. Um, Spirit told me that when whales, um, well, whales were actually intentionally beaching themselves because they hold, they hold this ancient knowledge that's been there since the Marga, since the creation beings. And so they come through at certain times um, so that those that ate upon it would absorb the information and have that wisdom so that then they could live in that way or express that energy in that way. And um, although um, there's a bit of knowledge around here lost around whales, um, Clint was actually able to confirm um what had come through to me and so that that came through to me a while ago and then I recently yeah asked Clint about it and um it's it's one of those one of those things where you know that beautiful ecosystem where we are actually all connected in this beautiful way and um it's funny that you know veganism has taken such a huge yeah it's like it's just kind of taking off because there is that element of it that's really beautiful where we're honoring life and we're um, honouring what we eat and we're thinking about the energy that we have within us. But I think the next step is, you know, looking at the energy of what some animals are actually wanting to gift us to then share and to hold. But I think we'll probably share a little bit more about it. That was a message from Spirit and then, yeah. Yeah. So whales, um, we have a sacred site. We've got a Dalo site for the whale. Um 
and um, <clears throat> um, people, the elders from the past, they used to work this Dalu site. They'd go there, activate it. By activating the Dalu, it would it would make the whales beach themselves, right? So they would only do that if they were given a message, basically from above, to do that. You know, they wouldn't. Otherwise, if you kept doing that, there'd be no more whales. You know, um, so when a whale beaches itself, we, we have to we have to end its life. We're going to end its misery because it's it's sacrificing itself. And when we then take that meat, that basically the energy that it's giving us, and when we consume it, we take it into us. You know, um, now a whale is an incredibly spiritual being itself um, and so whoever happens to inherit that whale's soul um, from the consumption of it you know when it goes inside that pregnant woman or it might even go into multiple you know women because um, of how big and powerful it is then you get all these really wise people that come about because of it you know um, but sharing really important knowledge. So we're not supposed to hunt whale. That's not, that is not what people are meant to do. Whales will only, uh, only meant to eat it when they sacrifice themselves to us, and that's why they beach themselves. Um, so a lot of people don't understand, oh, you know, are they beaching themselves because they're sick and this and that? And, no. and I, suppose, <laughs> I suppose more and more these days they are getting sick from the ocean because people are polluting the seas, you know. But they've been beaching themselves for thousands and thousands of years, and they beach themselves because they need us to consume them because we're not meant to hunt them, see. Mm -hmm. But they need to be eaten, I suppose, in that sense, going back to what I said earlier, so that they, they can be absorbed into the people, and then you get these wise people that come from out of that um, whale sacrificing its life. And it's exactly the same with the echidna. In my culture, how I'm taught by my pe people of today is that we're not allowed to go out and kill echidna. Um, and it's very easy to kill an echidna, right? You could, anybody could do it. But what we have to do is we, have, we must ask the echidna first to give up its life. So we've got to talk to it. And we have to talk to it in the language of the place that it's from. <clears throat> so if it's a Naroloma country, you're going to talk in Naroloma language. If it's an Injibani country, you're going to talk in Injibani language. You can't talk in that any other language unless it's from that area where that animal is from. Now, if you talk to it and you say to it, you'd say to it, um, there's the English interpretations. You know, I, I want to look at your chest so I can see your scars. And once you show me your scars, you must now give up your life so that I can consume you and, and share you with my family so that we can take your spiritual energy. That's what you've got to tell it, but in Aboriginal. Now, if it's convinced that your intention is good and that's exactly what you're wanting to do, it will roll over onto its back, open up its chest like its arms will spread out and then tell you, basically telling you, you can take my life. Now, if you, if you get to that point, you have to kill it, not with anything other than a quartz stone. Why quartz? Quartz is very powerful, energetic, spiritual stone, right? We all know that. It can only be killed with quartz, nothing else. So if you want to receive that energy from that animal, you've got to kill it with the right thing too. And um, after it's killed, you cut out the glands, on its chest, um, can't eat that. But also, and I'm, I've got to go backwards a little bit now to tell the story, is anybody who wants to kill that animal can't just be any, any average person. They, they've got to have scarring along here, along the chest, because the echidna has the glands on its chest that resemble the scarring. So that's the law of the echidna. So you've got to get the scars to be able to kill it, to eat it. So you cut all that out, gut it, go down to the river, make a fire, burn the quills off, 
dig a hole, wait for the fire to die down to coals, put some coals in the hole, put the kidney in there, cover it over, put the rest of the coals on top and cook it. Now, from the moment you kill it to the moment it's cooked, you're not allowed to drink any water. Mm. You're not allowed to consume water at all. That's, that's, that's your punishment for taking the life of a highly sacred animal, you know. So you've, you've got to punish yourself in order to eat it, to consume it. So the person who does all this, that's, that's their job. And if they've done all that and the way that it's meant to be done and then they cut the animal up equally and then they give the richest parts to the elders and the not-so-rich parts go to the kids. Um, <clears throat> but after it's been consumed, the, the marga, who are watching this the entire time, they will look, they'll look down and think, yep, you did the right thing. So when, when you die in the afterlife, this will be favoured upon, you know. Yeah. So they watch everything, everything we do. And that's why we got to do it a certain way, do it, do it in a particular process. But um, that's the same thing like with the whale and everything else. It's got to be done a specific way. We're consuming not just the animal, we're, we're taking in their, their soul, their spirit, you know, as well. And it's all connected to the spiritual realm, everything we do. That's our thing. And I'll have make a comment about the vegans. I think vegan veganism today is super important. I think they've suddenly appeared because they have to, um, mm. to try and help people understand that animals are, they are sacred things, you know. Um, but I think some of them are getting a little bit, like they are getting extreme, they're getting a little bit lost in it. And, and they can't be judgmental over others too about, you know, you, because you have you've got to have balance in life. Everything is all about balance. And and I applaud the vegans for what they are trying to achieve, but don't do it in a negative way. You know, be positive about it. Educate. Help people understand why. Yeah. Don't force people to do things they don't want to do because that's never worked. Throughout all of humanity it has never worked. You know, when you force or try to indoctrinate people into a way it, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it's not, you know, people then, they, they look at you in a negative way and they associate it as part of a stigma and then it takes away the message you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not being criti critical of those people. I'm just trying to say that they've got to um, do it not so harshly or rough or, you know, my, and don't... My, 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 my understanding of language is um, English language too isn't the best, you know, because so, I, I speak many languages. <laughs> uh, you're doing a great job there, Clint, and I agree. Look, I think that the whole planet needs to clean up its act in how it treats animals and uh, the cruelty that um, is, <clears throat> is being experienced across the planet by our animal kingdom and, uh, you know, we do really need to be mindful of these beautiful sentient beings that are, that are coming here to assist in our growth in, um, and that we're kind of partners here, all of us experiencing this, this world as these sentient beings. And I, there's nothing I, I ever want to see when it comes to cruelty to animals. But I also yeah. um, really honour the cycle of life and the ritual and that there are many people out there from many different cultures that hold strong ritual around animals and their place and how they interact with them and that there's not just one shoe that fits all. I think it's really um, the vegans are doing a really great job in bringing an awareness um, about yeah. factory animals and, um, you know, uh, just the, the level of animals that are kept in cages for co fur coats and, you know, soft toys for yeah. kids and, and all of that sort of stuff. I, you know, I think is abhorrent as well. And um, but I just, yeah. I just, um, I just think that we we all just have to remain balanced and respectful of everyone and all cultures, and that we're all on a path yeah. in a different place. And um, and can we all do better? Yeah, we can all do better to be responsible in 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 the choices we make when it comes to food. But you know, I know I've read a lot of studies as well about. Um, monocrops that, um, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of animals are killed just producing one monocrop 
because of all the possums and the natural yeah. the insects and there's and the frogs and there's um like thousands and thousands of all sorts of animals and ecosystems that are destroyed creating monocrops for soybean and other plant-based products so it's like we can't win you know like as we're all i think we're all trying to do the right thing and and for me it's like what's the most sustainable thing i can do that puts the least amount of stress on the planet and i think that's that's just how i try and work it and and what's the most sustainable way of living is wild harvesting living off the land taking things that grow naturally yeah the way that my people live have lived for thousands of years a lot of other indigenous peoples and you know once upon a time everybody lived like that you know and it was the most sustainable way of living um and it's it's proven to be um but the issue is we live in modern day people want to eat they've got to consume things that are grown in a farm especially large numbers of people you know and so we've got to look at how can we improve upon that to make it more sustainable and eco-friendly you know um so yeah me i'm trying to go out and teach people how to live off the land as best they can um but i can only do it with so many people you know we need to do that we need to come up with a, a better way of farming and and the rest of it what what has been working previously is no longer working today you know so it's it's, it's not a it's not a sustainable way it's not a it's not going to work for the next 10,000 years or whatever it is <clears throat> talking about animals too and you can see there's a beautiful coastline behind me um a lot of aboriginal people indigenous get um um what do you call it um persecuted I suppose um for eating turtles turtles have been something we've been eating for thousands of years I you know I I eat turtles still today. I don't go hunting them anymore, but if some family go out and get turtle, then I'll eat it. And I don't hunt them because turtle is my late sister, that's her totem, you know, so I can't I can't kill them. I'm not allowed to, but if someone's already gone out done it and they offer me a bit of turtle meat, I'll I'll eat some, you know, I need lots, but um too often we've got and I and I know where people are coming from. They're like turtle numbers have declined significantly and and um you know they're getting poisoned by pollution in the sea and so forth and and people want their numbers to recover don't take it out on the indigenous people who have lived sustainably off this meat for generation upon generation you you aim in your rifle at the wrong people if if anybody we need to um aim that rifle at the people who produce all the plastics you know all that stuff the straws the water bottles everything that ends up getting thrown in the sea because it's not the indigenous people who are just you know wiping out numbers of turtles because we know how to we know how to hunt them sustainably we've been doing it forever um and that goes with any other animal you know but for some reason we get we get picked on because of the turtle and and they're beautiful creature and um and they they have a lot of significance to us from a spiritual point of view too we have big big song lines and sacred sites right right down the road here from me um there's a beach and it's got all these massive big boulders there but the boulders from the dream time are the eggs of the giant turtle that came from south of here from the rogue river your river mary mm. when you lived came from that way it came up or used to be a land turtle went into the sea it transformed into a sea turtle and then it needed to um because it had changed and became another creature it needed to um make more numbers of itself so it laid all these eggs along the coastline and then the eggs would hatch and there would be more and more turtles you know but some of the eggs stayed there and so they turned into these big boulders that are located in some of the country around here and then this turtle went up everywhere 
spreading its kind across the world, you know, when it swam, you know, up along the coast to all these different places. But um, um, the turtle then became highly revered by my people from that that ancient turtle. <clears throat> and so there's lots and lots of rock art, petroglyphs of turtles, um, which helped to teach us to, like if we're going to consume them, to help teach us to do it in a positive way, you know. So never, never take a pregnant turtle, wait till after a, a specific time to go and hunt the turtle in after it's laid its eggs, um, to know which the difference between male and female turtles because most people don't know. Um, so we, we learn all this sort of stuff, you know, and, and it helps us understand how to, how to hunt them sustainably. Um, and we know that we can only take so many. And um, within, within my own people, and I think this is where this where this um, environmentalists are getting angry with indigenous people. There are some indigenous people who uh, have forgotten the old ways. They like the taste of this particular animal and they get greedy and they go out and they consume too many and they take them at the wrong time, you know. And like I said, they're going to get punished in this life for all the things that they do. So something will happen to them eventually. But, mm. but we don't want people to get punished. We want everybody to know and understand the right way of doing things. So I go out and I tell people, indigenous included, and I say, hey, I notice you've been going out catching too many of this particular animal, turtle in this case. Sometimes they go get dugongs. And then I say, you need to slow down because if I'm noticing, other people are noticing that you're going out and you're hunting too many things. And for starters, some of them might not even be from this particular area. You know, they might be... They might not be a traditional owner. They might be from other parts of Australia, you know. So we tell them, you can go out and hunt a turtle. But remember, you're not on your own traditional lands too. So if you go out and you do the wrong thing, the old people, the ancestors, spirits, they're going to um, punish them, you know. And what happened one time, there were these guys out here and they, they're from the Kimberley. And they had a boat full, they had a, a boat full of turtles that they'd caught live, you know. And they were out, they, they had about four or five of them. You're only supposed to take one, maybe two max, you know. Um, they had about four or five of them, and they were coming back towards the shore, um, and then they'd take the turtles, you know. Their intention was to take the turtles and slaughter them, cook them up, whatever. But as they were coming back, coming around the coast, um, their boat started sinking. Water was, I don't know what happened, but yeah, water started coming into their boat and eventually their boat had sunk and they were out in the middle of the ocean, you know, and all the turtles ended up swimming away and these silly blokes were all stranded in the water and the rangers from here had to go and help them out. <clears throat> and then they asked them what happened and they said, oh, we went out hunting for turtles. And then the ranger said, hey, you might not supposed to be hunting turtles, do you? Did you go and ask the elders for permission and this and that and so on and so forth and that? And they said, how'd your boat sink? They said, we don't even know. It just started filling up with water and it ended up sinking. And, so, and then they turned around and said, well, that's the old people punishing you. You know, that's the ancestors punishing you because you're going out doing the wrong thing. So bye-bye boat and uh, hopefully they learned their lesson. But mm. yeah, so things, things do happen in this lifetime. But Sometimes it, it, it takes a while for that to actually kick in, you know. Um, yeah, but I thought I'd mention that. Yeah, I love it. The ancestors are always watching. I can feel them. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted then, but I was going to say sometimes um, karma is quick and sometimes it takes a bit, yeah. right? <laughs> so yeah. there's kind of instant karma there. Uh, well, it's been such a delight. We've been going on for like... Uh, <laughs> ages here and it's oh wow two hours and 44 <laughs> like nearly three hours uh, i'll put it up in two parts it's been such a great talk so many things that we've covered and i've just loved it clint and you're just uh, so knowledgeable in 
in so many areas and I think people are craving this information now and um, so would, would you come back on again if we've got other things to talk about? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I really think that people are really craving to know more and, um, uh, you know, I know you've helped Madeline a lot in, in when she was going through all of her spiritual sort of dark night of the soul and um, I've experienced that. So maybe that can be another talk that we can do, um, yeah. you know, about because a lot of people when they go through that initiation of the, the dark spirits, it's it's quite scary and, and, and when mm. the beings start coming and visiting um, and maybe we can talk about what that is and our experiences with that. Yeah, that would be good. And that, that one I think is very important because, um, yeah, when people first come into that situation, it's, it's very um, um, overwhelming, you know, and, and, and they don't know what to do and, and they, they, you know, think they're going insane and this sort of stuff. And all we want to do is help them and say, look, you're not going crazy. You're just going through an experience and we can help you get through it. Yeah. I agree. Well, absolutely awesome. I really have enjoyed um, all of you um, coming on and uh, we'll make an, a time to catch up again and and, uh, and help people get through some of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, have a wonderful day. I'm so envious of where you're living, Clint. Oh, my God, I'm looking at that background and I'm like in winter in Victoria. And like, oh, <laughs> so I kind of just want to be there. <laughs> so... Uh, Awesome stuff, guys, and I'm just just really awesome. So thank you so much, and um, we'll uh, we'll catch up again soon. No worries. Thanks for inviting me in. No worries. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Madeline. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>